Good morning, church. Good morning. We join each other across the world, different devices and different times, yet we continue to be drawn by the same truth. No matter who we are, no matter where we are on life's journey, we are welcome here. Let us begin our time together and stand for the responsive call to worship. Christ is risen, Alleluia. Alleluia, Christ is risen indeed. Please join me in the sun call and response.
Good morning. morning. Happy Happy Easter. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, this morning we come to you in joyful exuberance with shouts of alleluia because your son, your incarnate self, could not be conquered by death, could not be imprisoned by the tomb. Just as you have shared in our frailty of human flesh, help us to share in your divine goodness, in your spirit. Help us to share in the mystery of resurrection. And let no shadow of death terrify us. Let no fear of darkness turn our hearts from the abundant, transformed life that you have for each of us. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, let us now seek God's transformation and God's forgiveness, knowing that even as we confess our sins, we confess our belief in a God who forgives. Let's pray together. God of grace, you call us to generosity. You are generous towards us, yet we often hold back. You give us the gift of time to serve, learn, grow, and share, yet we often spend our time serving self. You have given us talents and abilities, yet at times we hide our gifts. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us. Remind us that you are a God of abundance and not of scarcity. Open our eyes to the possibility of full life when we give graciously and dream boldly. Amen. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us give thanks and share a sign of Christ's peace with those around us. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Grace to you all in peace in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome to worship here at Ewing Covenant Presbyterian Church. So glad to welcome you all this morning, any visitors especially. We are so glad that you're here. In fact, if you are a visitor, I'd like to let you in on a little secret. We actually do this whole thing every week. <laughs> Can you believe it? And what I want you to know is that as great as it is to celebrate Easter this morning, as wonderful it is to see the church fairly full, what we have here on the normal weeks is so much more meaningful, is so much more worth it. So today we pray that all of you would feel welcomed, that you would get a sense of what it's like to be in a community like this one. And if you would be so kind, if you're new here, there are connect cards in the pew racks in front of you. If you would just fill one out, drop it in the offering plate as it goes past, this is the best way for us to get to know you, for the church to be in touch, and I have made it just about as easy as I know how. And with that, I invite you to join us in the sung prayer for illumination. Good morning. The scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken, the away, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings that lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, 
and the cloth that had been placed on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus then said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you have laid him, and, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God on this day celebrating the resurrection. Thanks.
question. Would you say that you're pretty familiar with the traditional Easter story, the one that we've just heard beautifully read by Helen? Actually, raise your hand if, more or less, you have a decent understanding of the typical Easter narrative. Yeah, that's what I thought. Great, we're going to go with the theologically advanced sermon. I mean, I figure since you all have a grasp of the fundamental idea, instead of rehashing what you already know, let me tell you a story about somebody there that day I bet you don't know. Fair warning, though. I hope that you like history, biblical studies, ancient languages, but even if you don't, I suppose it's too late. <laughs> You're kind of trapped. And even if those topics do not interest you, what I'm going to tell you is so cool, is so radical, that they're talking about changing the Bible. Anyway, it is all a bit complicated, so I can't just tell you what it is up front. In order for you to really get it, we need to work our way through this step by step. Now, it all centers around the Marys. So I figure a good starting point is probably a review of our homonymous cast. So out of curiosity, how many Marys do you recall from the Gospels? Just a guess and shout it out. OK. I see lots of threes, twos. Well, depending on how you count, there's roughly between five and nine. So you're all wrong. And that's not at all surprising, because estimates are that at that time, as many as one in four women had that name. You'll be relieved, though, that to make it easy, I would like to focus on the three that you probably know best. There's obviously the so-called Virgin Mary. Others have called her the Theotokos, the God-bearer, a title which I vastly prefer to virgin. This is, of course, the Mary who gave birth to Jesus. And great as she is, she's not so much our star today. Then we have Mary of sisters Martha and Mary. You've heard of them, right? Luke tells us that the sibling duo hosted Jesus and the disciples at Martha's home. Remember that detail on home ownership, because it's going to be significant later. You know, though, this is the story where Mary's just kind of lounging around, chatting with the disciples, having a great time, while Martha is working herself into a frenzy. We will spend a little time on that, Mary. But then there is the infamous, the notorious, the one and the only Mary Magdalene. And who this woman is, what she might mean for us today, she's our focus. Now, I imagine that most of you have probably heard some rumors about this woman, that she was some sort of a sex worker. Only they have not called her that as a simple statement of her profession. It has been meant to discredit her, to harm her. And by the end of this morning, I hope to convince you that it is only one piece in a larger effort to silence her. And by the way, for the real church history buffs, this rumor about how Mary made her living, it has no historical merit. None. Zip. Some man, it's always a man, <laughs> some man, Pope Gregory to be exact, preached an Easter sermon in 591 and conflated Mary Magdalene with another woman who was unnamed in Luke's gospel, the one that washes Jesus' feet with her hair. And that pope just goes on right ahead to assume that, number one, this woman is obviously a sex worker. And number two, that this is Mary Magdalene. Thanks for that, Greg. <laughs> anyway, for the most part, what we actually know of Mary Magdalene in the Gospels is that she was a follower of Jesus, that she knew him very well, and according to this morning's text from John, Mary Magdalene was the very first person that Jesus revealed himself to on Easter. She was also the very first person to preach on the resurrection. 
Think about what that means. At a time when, legally speaking, women were barely above property, Jesus did not appear first to the men, the ones whose testimony would have been considered far more valid. He appeared first to the women, to Mary Magdalene, and had her preach resurrection to all of the male disciples. Don't you just know that Peter was fuming? <laughs> okay, so now that we've laid out our main cast of Marys, we can really start to get into this big news that I've promised you. And on that note, I really do hope that you've had some coffee because I need you to remember and think back about another Bible story. Does the raising of Lazarus ring a bell? Okay. It's in John chapter 11. Suffice it to say that Jesus gets the call that his sick friend Lazarus needs help. But when he gets there, Lazarus has already gone and died. But no problem. No biggie when you're the son of God. So he quickly resurrects his friend. Now where things get interesting for our purposes is determining who exactly was there that day to witness this miracle or more specifically, which Mary was there. Of course, if you were to open your Bible right now to John chapter 11, it would say something along the lines of this. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Listen to that again. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So if the question for us is which Mary was there, you might say, well, that's easy. It must have been the Mary of sisters Martha and Mary. But you'd be wrong again. And to be fair, that is basically what the entire world thought until just recently when a woman named Dr. Elizabeth Schrader was doing research at Duke Divinity. And she has access to a manuscript called Papyrus 66, which if you didn't know, that's not a strange font on Microsoft Word. <laughs> it just so happens to be one of the oldest, if not the most ancient copy of the gospel according to John. So Dr. Liz is looking at the oldest known version of the story of Lazarus's resurrection, John chapter 11. And I picture her adjusting her glasses, translating this out loud, and she would read, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Mary, dot, dot, dot. Did you hear the difference? Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Mary, dot, dot, dot. There is no Martha. Folks have read this scroll for the better part of a hundred years, and no one had noticed that in the oldest record of this story, Martha is not there. In fact, as she realized this discrepancy, Dr. Schrader is thinking, okay, what on earth is going on here? So she starts looking more closely. She pulls out that magnifying glass. The theme from National Treasure begins to play in the background. And lo and behold, at the second mention of Mary, someone had written right over it in Papyrus 66 and changed it to Martha. In Greek, it would be barely noticeable because the difference between the two names are just one letter. That means that one little stroke of the pen, or whatever pens were 2,000 years ago, and that is all that it takes for the second occurrence of Mary to become Martha. Not only that, but as Dr. Schrader continues her detective work, she finds that in the rest of the chapter, every time that Mary shows up, Martha has simply been added into the margin. And every instance of the word sister has been changed to sisters. If you're struggling to see why that is the groundbreaking new information that I promised you, 
I'm getting there. You see, with Martha in the Lazarus story and John, the Mary there, by default, is Mary of sisters Martha and Mary. With Martha there, there'd be no reason to even ask, which Mary is this? And the thing is, even if the discovery of an edited text hasn't yet convinced you, there's basically no way that Martha and Lazarus were related or that she would be there at all. Remember how in Luke 10 I told you it was significant that Martha owned the home? If Lazarus were her brother, it would be his home. Because at that time, if a woman had any male relatives, a brother, a friend, an uncle, a cousin, whatever, the house would have been his by default. Not Martha's. All this means that for whatever reason, Martha has been added to the Lazarus story in John. And now that we know that Martha was not there, the Mary there can only be the one that was there at the crucifixion, the Mary that was first in the garden on Easter. Everything points to this Mary being none other than Mary Magdalene. That's the first thing I need you to understand. A little bit more to talk through. So it's always been kind of the working assumption that Mary Magdalene was called that because she's from Magdala, a small fishing village in Palestine with that name. And if you were to go there, that's exactly what they would tell you at the visitor center. It's exactly what the tour guide would say on whatever tour you take. The only problem is that Magdala wasn't called that when Mary Magdalene was alive. In Aramaic, which in case you've forgotten is the language that Jesus spoke, Magdala means the tower. And if Magdala wasn't a place when Mary Magdalene was alive, and it obviously wasn't a last name, the only logical conclusion is that Jesus doesn't call her Mary from Magdala. Jesus gives her a title. He names her Mary Magdala. He calls her Mary the Tower. As far as New Testament scholarship goes, that's huge. Probably be the biggest thing in our lifetime. And when you hear that Jesus calls her the Tower, in the context of Scripture, does it make you think of anything else? Does it make you think of anyone else? How about the rock? And I don't mean some subpar actor. <laughs> I mean Peter, a.k.a. Simon Peter. Now, most of you probably know that the name Peter means rock. And what is interesting, subtext, what is deeply patriarchal, is that over the years, there's not been this confusion like with Mary. We haven't mistakenly called him Simon from Peter. It's always been Simon Peter, or even just... Peter, just the rock. In the man's case, we've just known that it was a title. And how is it that Peter gets this title? Well, Peter gets the honor of being called the rock from his confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. This happens in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Simon is the first to articulate who Jesus is in his fullness in those three Gospels, and in return, Jesus gives him that title. But what about in John? Who confesses that Jesus is the Messiah in John? Well, again, if you were to open your Bible back to John chapter 11, after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, your English translation would say, that Martha says, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Except we now know beyond a reasonable shadow of doubt that it wasn't Martha that said that. It was Mary Magdalene. Which means that this woman called the Tower was not only the first one that Jesus revealed himself to on Easter, she was not only the first one to preach the resurrection, she also has the enormous distinction of being the first to confess Jesus as the Messiah. 
And as far as I see it, some monk, 1,500 years ago, copying all this down, said, oh, no. <laughs> we can't have that. We can't let some woman have all those honors. So with a deviously simple edit, Mary Magdalene in John 11 becomes Mary and Martha, and Mary the Tower is lost to us for 1,600 years. I can hear that some of you are praying for mercy from this morning's <laughs> intensive review of New Testament history and Aramaic. So you'll be glad to know that we're almost done. The last thing I need to say is why the uncovery of Mary the Tower is important to us as we celebrate the resurrection. Here's what I think. Jesus didn't come to die for some future promise of revelation or heaven. That is not what this is about. Jesus did not come to die. He came to show us how to live. He came to bring about a divine kingdom. He came so that the last would be first, so that the marginalized would be brought into the fold, so that maybe we might simply love our neighbors and that we would do those things right now, in this lifetime. And although tragically it's been covered up, I believe that he also came to name Mary Magdalene, Mary the Tower. I believe that Jesus came to take on our flesh, that he died for his radical ministry, and then he specifically and intentionally chose to reveal the full meaning of that same ministry to a marginalized woman that culture and the church have derided for centuries. I believe that he came to give Mary Magdalene a title like the tower as evidence for us that in God's realm, there is no room for misogyny, there is no room for prejudice, there is no room for hatred of any kind that in God's realm, there is only room for love and love for all people. And that death itself could not put an end to that kind of liberating love that Jesus rose again to live among us. That is incredibly good news. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand either in body or in spirit and join me in the responsive litany. This is the day God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Christ is risen indeed. This is the good news we have received in which we are free. Alleluia. Christ is risen indeed. That Christ died for love of his people, was buried and rose again on the third day. Alleluia. Christ is risen indeed. He appeared first to Mary, whom he commissioned to preach the gospel and in so doing, commissions us to. Alleluia, Christ is risen indeed. And now he appears even to us through his gospel, through his sacraments, and through the love of life together in community. Alleluia, Christ is risen indeed. Will you join me in singing hymn number 106?
You may be seated. Friends, this morning it is with sadness I share again the news of the passing of Judy Carapeza. The family has arranged for services this Thursday at Polson Van Heys in Lawrenceville. Visitation is 2 to 4 p.m. with a short worship service at 3.30. We ask that you keep Judy's family in prayer. Will you join me in prayer using the response in your bulletin? Risen Lord, this morning we offer up our prayers, spoken and unspoken, through Christ, through the one who is risen from the dead, through the one who named Mary the Tower and who names each of us today. First, we pray for all nations. We pray that the message of your liberating grace would be spread throughout the world, that the dominion of death would have no more until each of your children lives free from the, from the effects of sin and oppression. Living God, hear our prayer. We pray for the earth, from the dust of this home that we have damaged. We ask that you would turn the hearts of all people towards the healing of your creation, that we might tend its beauty, its wonder and glory. Help us to become better stewards of the earth that you've given not only to us, but to so many creatures. Living God, hear our prayer. And through the love of Christ, we pray for our town and for the community that surrounds us. Give hope to those who wait courageously for good news. Turn their mourning into dancing and their sorrow into joy. Give connection and belonging to the lonely and the hurting. Living God, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for this beloved community, for our church. Let us be a living witness to the power of resurrection. Let us model the difference that Easter makes in our world and in the way that we live. Let us be a welcoming and inclusive family of faith one that heeds the voices of peoples long silenced, one where testimonies from folks of every gender, background, and experience are uplifted and celebrated and honored. Living God, hear our prayer. We pray all these things in the name of the one who rose from the dead to live once more among his people, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The psalmist proclaims that the earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it the world and those who live in it. The blessings of life and breath, friendship and financial resources are gifts from God. In that spirit, we thank you for your own gifts of generosity, which support the ministries of Ewing Covenant Presbyterian Church.
Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may we give generously today, in spite of our limitations and fears, that we might offer to others our gifts, hearts. Bless them and our lives to your service, that they may reveal your glory, nurture faith, and manifest justice for all your children. Amen. Please join us in singing hymn number 122. Well, if you thought the sermon was more of a dry lecture than preaching, I have bad news. It's time to assign the homework. <laughs> and it's this. In honor of Mary the Tower, listen to the stories and the voices of people's long silenced. And remember that God calls us to use our own voice to celebrate and empower the voices that our culture and churches and communities have kept hidden. And may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's countenance be lifted upon you and give you peace now and always. Amen. <laughs>